Hi, I'm Alan Hedblum. Welcome to our show, a place to feel like you belong. If ever you should feel safe to be in a room, it's with our next guest. Brian Kingshot wrote the book on law enforcement, and after decades of policing, he now teaches criminal justice at Grand Valley State University. Brian is also bi-coastal, living fall and winter academic semesters on America's North Coast and spending summer and winter holidays on the southwest coast of his native England. Brian, welcome to Feel Like You Belong. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. So your mother said that you came into the world with a bang. Yes, she did. Can you tell us? Well, I was born in uh, World War II. I was born in London, uh, in a street called Porton Road in West London. And I was born in uh, number, house number 15. Now, just before I was born, um, uh, there'd been a air raid warning and that was going to happen. Um, obviously my mother couldn't go anywhere but my sister was taken down to the shelter and uh, what occurred then um, was I was still in the birth uh, canal but uh, a bomb hit the street and uh, from I would say I was in number 15 but 40 to 60 was just totally decimated it went and then um, that made my mother totally deaf in one ear uh, that was bleeding and then uh, that shock sort of sent me out of the birth uh, you know, canal very, very, very quickly. And mother always said, well, you came into the world, you know, with a bang. So, so she had a good sense of humor. Oh, yeah. She was a, a, a wonderful woman. Yeah. And during that time, your dad was in the war in North Africa, correct? Yes, he was. He'd, he'd just been um, injured. He was one of, um, uh, in uh, North Africa, they had um, uh, Sterling, uh, and Sterling started the SAS and uh, the uh, Special Air Service. And what it was, my father was with him in a group. They would go behind uh, the enemy lines to identify the, um, the fuel dumps that the, uh, the Germans had, and they'd map them so they know where it was, so that when the British forces advanced, um, then they, they didn't have to carry all the fuel with them. They could steal it off the Germans. Oh. And uh, uh, that was the, he was in the uh, British First Army, but everyone talks about the British Eighth Army, uh, which were known as the Desert Rats. Um, and my father was always, when that came, he said, well, it, we were there first, you know, I don't know why they're talking about them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but he, he was there and um, he, he got uh, blown up um, uh, doing some mine clearance because they, they'd clear the mines to the damp so that they could actually map it, so that you know, you'd know you know where the mines were if you were going in there. Uh, but one uh, went off and he was uh, you know, very, very seriously injured. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was um, triaged to an um, uh, American uh, hospital in North Africa and uh, stayed there for, uh, you know, I think it's about nine months. He had over 800 uh, stitches, external stitches, oh and my. internal stitches put in sure. his lower legs and back. So. Now, is there a military history in your family? Because you were in the in the Merchant Navy. Yes, I was. Uh, no, um, uh, n not really. I, I, um, I, I went into the Merchant Navy because I wasn't sure what I was going to do. But whilst I was in there, I was very lucky. I was able to work for the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. I went in as a radio and electronics officer. And so uh, working with the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, they're the, um, the supply ships that go to the Royal Navy at sea and resupply them with ammunition, fuel and food and things like that. But they're all Merchant Navy officers. And we always said to uh, you know, the Royal Navy officers, well, you need us because you couldn't put a Royal Navy officer in charge of this because they'd never find you. <laughs> they're not that good. <laughs> and so there's always that, that rivalry. And so being part of that and doing the electronics, um, I sort of drifted into the intelligence side of it. And so uh, where I was sort of uh, all sensibly sending back weather messages, it was actually coded messages about the things that were happening around us. Secrets. Yeah, so. Okay, which I won't ask you about. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's okay, because uh, what happened is um, I did my training uh, going back to World War II. In World War II, um, Germany was very uh, good at um, stopping the supply ships with the U-boats. And this is because they had a machine called the Enigma machine. 
It looked like a, an ordinary typewriter, but it had four extra wheels on it. You'd set the wheels, um, and say each wheel had 26 settings. So you'd, you'd say set it at uh, A, B, C, D. And then when you actually typed it, it, um, it was totally encrypted. And you had to type it on the other end with a similar machine, and they'd have to have their wheels set at A, B, C, D. Oh. And then it would all come out, you see. Uh, well, um, that was uh, that code was actually broken in a place called Station X, which is a, a country house uh, about 40 miles north of London called Bletchley Park. It's now a museum. But I, I trained there as well, and because you realise it was only sort of 20, less than 25 years after the end of World War uh, II, so uh, I was still there looking at things that Turing had looked at and, mm -hmm. and all the Enigma machines and, and learning and all those codes. And there's a recently released movie on that. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, about Alan Turing, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was very, very sad because uh, I, I, I never met him. He'd, he'd committed suicide at, at the age of, I think, about 42. And, and that was simply because he was gay. But that is some of the tragedies that, you know, happened, you know, in earlier times. Sure. So was it your experience in the, um, in the Navy that got you interested in police work? Well, no, I, I, I came out because I, I came out of uh, the Merchant Navy and then I was uh, with the intelligence service full time. But um, uh, that uh, you couldn't. My wife didn't know where I was. You know, uh, she would get um, uh, w wherever I was. I could write a letter to her, but that would then go to um, somebody that would edit it and delete things like where well, you can't mention the temperature, you can't measure, measure the weather, and things like that. They'd delete all those things, and it'd be uh, encrypted. Then it'd be sent to London, and then at London, it'd be decrypted, and they'd be typed up. And so my wife would just get a. Um, a type letter with the London postmark saying, I'm okay, <laughs> and uh, I'll see you soon. <laughs> and and that, that, that was it. You know, you couldn't say anything, you know, about it. So I needed to come out of that. And mm. so I decided, well, I was so specialist, I'll go back in, I'll have to go back in the Navy. But then somebody said, well, why don't you try the police force? So I said, well, maybe. I said, and then I said, okay. And then I applied for the police force. And I said, well, whoever answers first, will actually, uh, that's who I'm going with. And the police, uh, you know, came through first and uh, I told the, you know, the government that this is what I wanted to do. And so they said, okay. And so I went for interview, um, which was a bit uh, surreal really, because I couldn't answer any of their questions. You know, they, like, well, what have you been doing the last five years? Mm, can't tell you. Can't tell you. <laughs> where, where, where were you? Uh, you know, uh, I can't tell you. Uh, well, what did you do? Well, can't tell you. You know, and in the end it was, uh, okay. Right, we've got to accept you, so go and draw your uniform. And, <laughs> and, and that was it. I thought, oh, does that mean I'm in? Yes, it is. Shut the door on the way out type of thing. So I thought, well, oh. maybe they gave you the job because they, they saw you could keep a secret. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know about that. I think it was just that uh, they were forced to and, you know, that was that. So... You're, you have a really interesting study history because you originally studied uh, some technical um, subjects, but then you have a degree in art history? Yes, I do, yeah, because uh, I, I just loved art and, um, and I, I like writing. And uh, down um, where I, I lived in Devon, there was an author called Henry Williamson. Now, Henry Williamson is well known, and one of his um, contemporaries um, was Thomas Hardy. And uh, his, uh, Williamson's work is used a lot in English language literature, mm -hmm. um, very, very well known. And uh, so uh, I knew him and I used to talk to him. And um, uh, he wrote uh, Tarka the Otter and Sailor the Salmon were my two favorite ones. And I used to speak to him about that. And uh, I, I remember about 16, I was about 16, and I said to him, I want to write one day, but I don't know what to write. He said, well, just put the paper in the typewriter or get it in front of you with a pencil and you put one word down and then you put another. <laughs> he said, you get the idea, that's what you've got to do. And so um, later um, I, there was a, an autobiography called R. Henry because uh, I, I met Henry uh, when I was uh, in the police force as well. I actually did a bur uh, investigated a burglary at his uh, writing lodge mm. and uh, so I, I knew him quite well and that all came out of um, on, on this autobiography, R. Henry, and uh, it, it, it always gives me a smile because you look in the back there, uh, you see um, uh, Keats, Kingshot, K. 
Kim Kipling, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm <laughs> sound list. I'm in the, in the list there, you know, and I think, well, you know, if nobody knows me, look, they're, they're, they're probably thinking, well, I know Keats, I know, I know Kipling, but who are they? You've got Who's good this? company. <laughs> well, and I yeah. wanted to, to mention, you have written a book uh, called Safe Overseas Travel, yes. and we'll show yeah. this to to our to our viewers. Um, but you have a lot of other interests as well, and I have to refer to my list here because you have published articles on human trafficking, crowd management, older criminals, gender issues, crisis management, violence in educational establishments, women in policing, terrorism, crisis negotiations, aircraft hijack, use of controlled force and arrests, police dogs, ethics, self-defense. Are you a Renaissance man or someone who's just highly unfocused? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, I find something that uh, is of interest to me. I mean, uh, because of my work on ethics, I was elected a fellow of the Royal um, School of Art in London. So um, I did that. But I've always been concerned about um, uh, the role of women, especially in policing and law enforcement. Mm -hmm. They've been discriminated against. And uh, when uh, you look here in the, this country, um, after the equal opportunities in the 1970s, there were only 9% um, uh, women in law enforcement. But when I looked again, when I wrote and uh, did some research, I wrote an article that 30 years later, uh, that had only risen to sort of 11.9%. percent mm. i thinking, why? And uh, there's so much bias uh, against uh, women. And uh, I, I'm lucky because in, in my policing, I had one particular uh, senior officer called Rachel James, and she was absolutely brilliant. And she she was my mentor, really. Um, she, I think what she said to me was, well, you know, you're you're hearing the words, but you're not listening. <laughs> you know, and so I thought, well, what, what does she mean about that? And very often it was. I wasn't listening to the, to the deeper meaning of what was going on. I wasn't picking up those nuances. And so um, I've always had an interest in, in women in relation to that. And, of course, now we have a problem with uh, human trafficking, not only labor trafficking, but sex trafficking. And mm -hmm. so uh, it, it all tends to run together, really. But when you, you mentioned about that um, crisis negotiation, well, uh, I was um, on the uh, UK government's uh, cadre of international hostage negotiators. So when uh, British citizens or citizens from Europe were taken hostage anywhere in the world, um, I went with a special forces team uh, tasked to actually uh, try and get those uh, hostages out. So uh, there, there was so much that I learned about other cultures and dealing with people Mm -hmm. um, that uh, it, it just made me sort of think about all kinds of things. And I, I just get a bee in my bonnet about thinking, I'm going to find out about that. Good for you. And well, that, that's what I do. Curiosity is a good thing. Well, I, I think so. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up soon, but I, I, I wanted to mention to our, uh, to our viewers that you came to uh, Grand Valley to start teaching after 9-11. Uh, yes, I did, yes. And, and why did they bring you in? Well, because I'd, I'd been working on terrorism and counterterrorism uh, for the last 30 odd years. And it was just to take the class for one semester, but it's, it's just stretched out a little bit longer. Well, it's turned you know, more, yeah, a dozen <laughs> years on now. And yeah. so, so you must be doing some, some really good things. Uh, well, I, I, I hope Grand so. Rapids. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, as you know, the theme of our show is belonging. Mm -hmm. And earlier you had been making some jokes about, you know, are, are you from Cornwall? Are you from Devon? And there's some, you know, some spirited rivalry between those two places. And so it makes you think, okay, where do I fit in? Um, what can you say that you've learned this last dozen years on this topic of belonging? Well, I, I think it's, it's really about people. It's about what you feel in your heart. And uh, for me, um, it, it came really when I was able to, uh, instead of uh, saying, well, uh, American policy should be doing this. And you got citizen, when you're getting citizenship, I can say, well, our policy needs to be. Suddenly, it wasn't me stood on the outside saying, you know, you should do this, you should do that. It was a question of, well, this is what we need to do. And I was suddenly inclusive. I was one of those people. So that, uh, that, that was important to me. And that, that's where I felt I belonged. Super, super. Our time has absolutely flown by, but I want to thank you for coming by the studio and, and sharing your story with us today. You're most welcome. Yeah, you bet. For our viewers, stay tuned. We'll be back in just a moment with some tips on American culture, American English, and a little bit of humor. English, like all languages, uses euphemisms 
when talking about embarrassing or harsh topics. For example, we say restroom instead of toilet because it sounds less dirty. And we say he was let go because it sounds nicer than he was fired. Another way to indicate delicate situations is to use the first initial instead of a strong word. You may have heard people talk about using the N-word, the F-bomb, or the B-word. The full mention of these words is considered impolite in public, so we abbreviate them. If you're curious, we explain these words in our What's Up blog. That's because they feel too rude for me to say on camera. A new way to change public conversation, then, is to name something with its first letter only, to make it sound like a bad word. Last year, you heard us talk about dropping the I word. In other words, avoiding illegal to describe immigrants in the United States without official documentation. I recently became aware of a campaign concerning the R word. R word is a euphemism for retard or retarded. It's used unkindly to refer to people with intellectual disabilities. Unfortunately, these words are often casually used by people in general conversation to refer to anything or anyone who is stupid. According to campaign organizers at rword.org, using the R word is like a slap in the face or a punch in the stomach to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and to their friends and families as well. The good news is that President Obama signed legislation called Rose's Law in 2010. After that, federal agencies began dropping language like mental retardation and mentally retarded from their documents, and most states have followed suit since then. However, even the most sensitive of us feel sometimes a little awkward about what language we should use. We don't want to offend and say the wrong thing. The expression recommended by the people at rword.org is intellectual disability. They sometimes abbreviate it as ID. I know it will take practice for many of us to start using the preferred language, but with time and commitment, I know we'll be able to make the switch, which will make all members of our community feel like they belong. I have a riddle for you. How do you make an octopus laugh? Give up? With ten tickles. <laughs>